And they say that you can take the man out of Minnesota, but you can't take Minnesota out of the man. And when Dr. Haugen is not working, he's usually, or often, I should say, at the uh, ice rink playing hockey. Uh, he enjoys running and reading, which when he's working at Wake Med, he does simultaneously. Um, Dr. Haugen will be uh, tackling the topic of PET CT. And by the way, he's only one of five radiologists, is five radiologists in our group that read, that read th these studies with any, um, with, with formalized training. And so please welcome Dr. Haugen. Bill told you, and um, I'm a body imager with Wake Radiology, and PET CT is one of my interests as well as Dr. Schultz's interest. But uh, for the next half hour or so, we're going to be talking about PET-CT. Okay. So the objectives for the half hour are, one, to define what PET-CT is, and two, to discuss the indications for PET-CT, and also to review some PET-CT cases, which I think are pretty interesting. So PET-CT, what is it? Well, it's the fusion of two modalities, both PET and CT, and we're going to find that the product of the two is truly greater than the sum of its parts. This is a picture of, of PET-CT in our facility in Cary. So the parts, we're going to start out with CT, or computed tomography. We've done, done a lot of talking on CT already. I'll briefly go through some of these. But CT is the workhorse of the modern radiology department, and it uses x-rays transmitted through the patients. And the constructs images on the other side based on differences in density. So historically, CT was invented in 1972 by Cormac and Hounsfield, and it's undergone generations of technological advances. We started out with a single slice CT, moved to a helical CT with the advent of slip uh, ring technology, and we've gone on to multi-detector CT, which allows multi -rows of, multiple rows of detectors to help us essentially image a larger field of view or a larger segment of the patient in a shorter period of time and reduce on motion artifact. Other things that have been invented, dual source CT uses actually two different energies of CT and detectors on the opposite sides to get different information about the body tissues. And finally, PET CT. So what are the strengths of CT? We've seen that already today, but the strengths really are spatial resolution and anatomic localization. Now, the other strength that I consider a strength of CT is that it is ubiquitous. You can't find a radiology department in the nation that doesn't have a CT scanner. And therefore, it's led it to become a historical standard for many subspecialties. Especially some different subspecialties that use CT often are musculoskeletal radiology. Now, the three-dimensional capabilities of CT really have allowed orthopedists to see fractures and injuries in a much different way than they used to. I need you to move that uh, off this. Off the movie. Thank you very much. There we go. Cardiovascular imaging has also seen a lot of recent advances with multi-detector CT. The multi-detector CT, is especially 64 slice CT, has allowed us to freeze the motion of the heart and get good looks at the coronary arteries, all in a non-invasive procedure. But one of the biggest utilizations of, of CT imaging has been oncology. Um, the spatial resolution and, and anatomic localization that CT offers has been very useful in essentially helping us monitor and detect CT, uh, monitor and detect cancers. So in oncologic imaging, CT is, has become essentially a historical standard in oncology, both for the detection of masses and for the diagnosis, as well as for staging initially and for treatment monitoring or restaging after treatment. But CT has limitations. Essentially, the inf information CT gives us is limited to size and density changes. It really offers no functional information, which is where PET really helps us. Just to illustrate this limitation, here's an axial CT slice on a patient who was diagnosed with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. This is a pretreatment examination through the epigastrium. And you can see this patient has some enlarged lymph nodes in the epigastrium, as well as an enlarged spleen. Now, the patient underwent treatment, and this is a post-treatment analogous CT slice through the epigastrium that shows that both the lymph nodes in the epigastrium and the spleen decreased in size. But is there any residual disease? This, this shows some response. Is it complete response? Is there, is there still disease harbored within these lymph nodes? 
So this is where PET helps us. PET illustrates functional information. Here is the analogous PET slice through the same level in a patient that shows that the pretreatment, the lymph nodes in the epigastrium, had a lot of activity, a lot of metabolism, and the spleen also was enlarged but also demonstrated a lot of activity. Post-treatment, however, you can see the difference. Those lymph nodes do harbor some activity in the epigastrium, but there's been complete response of disease within the spleen. So that moves us along to PET. What is PET? Well, it's an, it's an acronym that stands for Positron Emission Tomography. We've also heard a little bit about that already this, this morning. But historically speaking, the idea of PET has been around since the early 50s, when there went a lot of development at a lot of different academic institutions, inclu including the University of Pennsylvania Hospital and Massachusetts General Hospital. And the first PET images were probably produced by Dr. Matsuo at Brookhaven National Laboratory sometime in the early 60s. So PET is a nuclear medicine examination. And what that means is that x-rays or gamma rays are emitted from within the body of the patient. The images reflect the localization of those radio tracers within the body. So what are radio tracers? Well, in short, a radio tracer is any bioactive molecule that has been labeled with a positron emitting marker. Now for PET, as Dr. Schultz mentioned, 2-18F fluoro-2-deoxydeglucose, or FDG, is really the workhorse of the PET department. It is an analog of glucose or sugar, and as he mentioned, it enters the cells through active transporters, gets phosphorylated within the cells, and undergoes no further change and gets trapped there. This is a, a three-dimensional model of what FDG looks like. There's a blue carbon skeleton, and you can see on the second carbon, one of the white hydrogens has been replaced with a, a positron emitting fluor fluorine 18 atom. Okay, so what does normal glucose uptake look like? Well, you see the spinning MIP image on the left is just PET data, and normal glucose uptake is seen in the brain, in the thyroid gland, in the heart, bowel, kidneys, and bladder. Now, so we have to use this information of normal glucose uptake to see what is abnormal or what parts of the body uptake glucose that aren't in these structures. So abnormal glucose uptake can be in any number of, of different situations, primarily malignancy. But other things can also cause increased glucose uptake, including infection, inflammation, and anything that causes increased metabolism. That might be trauma, uh, muscular activity, or brown fat. And we'll get into some of those, some of those foolers or artifacts later in, when we show some case examples. So abnormal FTG uptake is seen in cancers, and they have significant hypermetabolism. That's partially caused by rapid mitosis and cell division within cancers, but also something called the Warburg effect. Now, Heinrich Warburg was a doctor in the early part of the 19th century that showed that cancer cells consume glucose and produce lactic acid even in the presence of normal oxygen levels, some work he earned the Nobel Prize for in 1931. But essentially, what the Warburg effect, me Warburg effect means is that malignant tumors tend to take up more glucose than normally dividing cells. So again, normal on the left, brain, heart, bowel, kidneys, and bladder, and abnormal on the right. This happened to be a lung cancer with florid metastatic disease. So PET-CT, when we fuse the two, PET and CT create an amazingly powerful tool. And the power is really in the fusion imaging that we can do with this. Now this is the same case that we saw before with just the PET data, but we've superimposed the anatomic localization ability of the CT examination so we can really tell where any hypermetabolism resides. So we'll get into some more images when we go over some cases. But before we do that, I'd like to talk about some indications for PET-CT. In order to do that, I went to the American Cancer Society website and came up with a couple of, uh, uh, of charts, including this one. This is the 2008 estimated U.S. cancer cases. This is incidence of cancer in the United States split between men and women and, between, and by individual tumor types. You can see the usual suspects for men, prostate, lung, colon, uh, bladder cancer, and non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, and for women, breast cancer at the top of the list, followed by lung, colon, and uterine cancer. Now, slightly different data from 2008 from the American Cancer Society. This is the estimated U.S. cancer deaths. So what are the most lethal types of cancer? And you can see for men, it tends to be lung and bronchus cancer as well as for women. And then we see prostate, colon, and pancreas in men, followed by breast, colon, and pancreas for women. 
Now, the reason I'm showing you this data is because the indications for PET closely track the incidence and death data and death data for United States cancer cases. In your handout, I think at the beginning of uh, your handout for my individual lecture, you're going to find a detailed, uh, a detailed list and delineation of what is covered and what is not covered, at least according to Medicare, for indications for PET-CT. And essentially this is a very abbreviated list. Now it's different for some tumors in terms of it's okay for diagnosis and staging but not restaging. They're all very individual, individualized based on tumor types. But I would, I would uh, suggest that you refer to that handout in the future if you have a, a patient who, who has one of those tumor types. But the bottom line is um, just about all tumor types are covered by, by Medicare. They're Medicare approved indications for PET-CT. Now there are other indications for PET-CT that we're not going to talk too much about. They are in the, in the areas of neurology and cardiology. In cardiology, there are indications and applications for cardiac viability and myocardial perfusion imaging. And in neurology, PET-CT can be useful for identifying seizure foci, as well as differentiating between dementia types, specifically Alzheimer's type dementia. But it's really oncology that PET-CT PET has its strength. And uh, the recent changes in the scope of reimbursable indications has really made it so that nearly all cancer subtypes are reimbursable and indicated for PET-CT both in the diagnosis or initial treatment strategy and for subsequent treatment monitoring or restaging. So what are the advantages of PET-CT? Well, I'm going to try to convince you that it gives you a more accurate initial staging. Additionally, it gives you targets for initial biopsy, sometimes that were very different from your original idea of where you'd like to biopsy. It also aids in surgical planning as well as overall oncologic planning, and I'll get into that with some uh, some data here for individual type tumors. So I just went back and looked through the, the literature for, for historical basis for, for why PET-CT is better. And in the, in the subheading of head and neck cancers, when we're, especially when we're looking at the initial staging of cervical metastases, Dr. Wong's group at Duke uh, found that CT alone classified stage correctly in head and neck cancers with cervical metastases in 69% of cases. But when patients had a CT and a PET, they classified stage correctly in 92% of cases. And there's been a lot of other studies that have shown a similar trend. Also in the head and neck cancer realm, and looking at outcomes, especially with patients with unknown primaries in head and neck cancer, there's been a change in management in a third of patients after a PET, PET scan. <laughs> and in terms of recurrent or residual disease, inappropriate surgery can be avoided in 31% of patients, at least according to the work by Dr. Volk. Now in radiation therapy in lung cancer, this is a totally different field, but lends more credence to the usefulness and accuracy of uh, PET-CT. We found that fusion images modify treatment plans by boosting radiation dose to the most viable or most active tumor regions and lymph nodes that harbor disease. Dr. Munlayan showed that PET-CT data influenced radiotherapy plans in over a third of patients. In interventional radiology, PET-CT also shows a lot of advantages. Specifically, Dr. Hilner and his uh, group published a paper in the Journal of Clinical Oncology in 2008 that said that, that essentially stated that PET-CT altered plans for biopsy in 76% of patients, either changed the, where they initially wanted to biopsy or changed the part of the tumor that they thought they wanted to biopsy. Similar data from Dr. Bashin in the Journal of Vascular Interventional Radiology 2008 he showed that PET-CT altered lesion selection for biopsy in half of the patients in comparison to CT data alone. Colorectal cancer, the similar data, FTG PET altered surgical decision making in a quarter to 29% of patients with unexpected metastatic lesions. So PET-CT is making a lot of differences in planning for all these different types of cancers. So with that, I thought I'd go through some case examples just to show you what PET-CT can show us and what the limitations are and what its advantages are. So the first couple of cases are going to look somewhat familiar. You'll, first, you'll see a, a rotating MIP uh, image with essentially with this just PET data. Now, I think it's not hard to see the abnormalities in this particular case. There we go. So if we took a representative sample through some of these areas, especially the axillary and mediastinal areas, we see that on the top we have a CT image. In the middle we have a PET data image. And on the bottom the fusion images that Dr. Schultz showed us originally as well. That in this particular case we see that the patient has large masses in the axilla and in the mediastinum that show significant metabolic activity. 
we can also look through a different selection, a different section of the patient, and you'll recognize this scan from earlier in the talk. This is a patient with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, enlarged spleen with a lot of activity. All right, so this is case number two. Does anybody see any abnormal activity in this case? Yeah, you might look at the neck, right? Well, the neck shows increased metabolic activity, but it does look band-like, doesn't it? And it's somewhat symmetric. That would be unusual for a cancer. That actually turns out to be just muscular activity. The patient must have been looking around a lot during his induction phase or watching a tennis match of some sort. But that actually is not the abnormality I was hoping that we'd all find. What I was looking at is the small nodule in the right upper lung. Here's some axial data. Once again, the CT on top, PET data in the middle, and the fusion images below that show an irregular spiculated nodule in the patient's right upper lobe. This might have been discovered incidentally by chest x-ray or on, incidentally on a chest CT for another reason. But this particular nodule shows increased activity within that nodule. And this turned out to be, well, I think this turned, was a solitary pulmonary nodule that eventually turned out to be a non-small cell, non cell lung cancer. This is the same data distributed in the sagittal and, and coronal planes, just to give you an idea of how well we can accurately localize these, this abnormal activity. I won't spend too much time talking about pulmonary nodules that I know Dr. Schultz just got done speaking about them, but they are a diagnostic dilemma because both malignant and benign possibilities are out there for these, for, for these nodules. And PET, can, PET CT can help guide management, as you mentioned. We can, it can lean us towards surveillance CTs or go on to biopsy. And furthermore, if biopsy is indicated, it can help us decide what kind of biopsy is safest and most efficacious for your patient, whether it be CT guided or biopsy guided by bronchoscopy or thoracoscopy or an open surgical biopsy. So it's the next case, case three. Okay, who sees the abnormality here? Right side, right? Right-sided chest. Well, let's take a look at where that localizes to on, on the axial images. So we see on the top image, we see some asymmetric activity in the right breast in comparison to the left. And also the PET data shows increased activity that correlates on the fusion image. So we also see that in the, in the projection MIP over, let me use the laser pointer here. And the, you see a lot of increased activity right around the, the major nodule that we see. And that would indicate that this was a, this was a breast cancer. And it had local regional disease in level one lymph nodes. So this isn't an eye test at all. Everybody can probably see the abnormality on this scan. Once again, it's another one of the indications for PET. This one happened to be a mass in the right lung. Not so irregular, but definitely large. And this was a non-small cell lung cancer. Fortunately for the patient, there's no increased activity in the mediastinum, no widespread metastatic disease in this particular case. So everybody take a good look at this spinning MIP image from PET data. Now, where, did you see the abnormality here? I'll spot everybody the liver lesion. Okay, that one wasn't hard to pick out. Anybody see anything else? Well, the first thing I'd like to look at is the pelvis. When we look at that on the axial plane, we see the bladder initially anteriorly, a lot of activity, and that's normal, as we talked about, normal distribution, but post posterior to it, we also see circumferential activity in the rectum in this patient. This patient had a positive colonoscopy and they found a mass. But of of course, that turned out to be a colorectal carcinoma, but as you all saw, to start with, there is a lesion in the liver that demonstrates metabolic activity, and this was colorectal cancer with a metastatic disease to the liver. I put a lot of these cases in here because I think it's most useful to see what a, what a test can do and can't do when you actually look at the particular images. Now, this one is not, a, it's not an eye test either. I think everybody can see the abnormalities both in the chest and throughout the pelvis. If we look at the initial, initial, an initial image through the upper mediastinum, you see this large mediastinal mass. And if you look close, you can also see a small focus of hypermetabolism that correlates with that left pedicle in the thoracic spine. So we could take another look through this, the activity in the pelvis, and I think this will show us as well that there's a lot of metabolic activity that's localizing to the sacrum and to the iliac bones. This was a small cell lung cancer with bony metastases. I think I got a few more cases that I want to look at. This is a unique protocol that we do for patients that present with head and neck masses for further characterization. Essentially, this is just three-dimensional data from a PET-CT that is localized, essentially 
concentrating on the head and neck. This wasn't much of an eye test either. It's a large mass that you can see. We'll take a look at it, a few different slices in the sagittal plane because I think it projects it the best. You can see a, a hypopharyngeal mass, significant metabolic activity, but really not much in the way of activity elsewhere. This turned out to be muscular activity and nothing. Looking at the same data in a slightly different way in the axial plane, which is the way we look at most of our studies, shows that this is a, a hypopharyngeal mass. This turned out to be a squamous cell cancer, but localized and locally invasive, but localized with no distant metastatic disease. I think we've got a couple more cases. This was an interesting case, and it's not so much what you see as what you don't see. See, in this particular case, there's no bladder activity and there's no right kidney activity. And this really isn't bowel. If you saw it spinning around, that's a ureterostomy bag. This patient came in follow-up for bladder cancer, and they've had a cystectomy and nephroureterectomy on the right. The abnormality on the scan really is right above that residual left kidney. There's a spot of activity up here that we couldn't quite explain. So we wanted to look at that on the, on the axial slices and see what it localized to. <coughs> when it turned out that that focus of activity isolated to transverse colon. And I did tell you earlier that colon can have, or bowel in general can have normal activity. But that's generally speaking if it's diffuse activity and not high grade. This is a focal area of significant high grade metabolic activity and the patient underwent a subsequent colonoscopy and they found a small mass, a locally invasive uh, colon cancer in the transverse colon. So this is an incidentally found cancer for a, a different reason. I think I've got two or three more cases. This is a, a slightly different protocol as well. You notice that instead of going through the midbrain to the mid thighs, which we usually do with PET-CT, this one goes from the top of the head all the way to the toes. This was a melanoma follow-up patient. You might have, if you've got some sharp eyes, you might have seen that there is some activity in the patient's axilla and that was actually improved from the scan before this, and that was their patient's known disease. But what caught our attention was some activity in the mid-abdomen. And we took a look at that area of activity, and it's anterior to the kidney. kind of looked like it was going to be the kidney, based on the way it was projecting on that MIP, but this localized to the pancreatic head, an uncinant process. This is another case of an incidental cancer. This was a pancreatic adenocarcinoma after subsequent biopsy that we found when we were actually restaging for, for melanoma. And this is just the same data in the coronal plane. I think I have two more cases. This was a patient who presented for breast cancer follow-up. And initially you look at the scan and you go, oh my goodness, she's going to get some bad news. But well, we took a closer look at this and it's actually very interesting. We look a look especially through the neck where a lot of that abnormal activity is. And when we look at it specifically, lots of activity, but it is symmetric. doesn't quite look band-like like that initial muscle activity that we saw in that previous case. This localizes exclusively to areas of fat, essentially areas of fat in the paraspinal tissues. This is what's known as brown fat. It is a fuller. This patient actually had no metastatic disease at all. Um, brown fat is, is somewhat of a mystery. Some people, th I think it's been described in as being in high concentrations in animals that hibernate, but this probably turns out that this patient was just very cold when they had their induction and they were shivering. Who knows? But no metastatic disease for them. This is the last case I have, and it's not so much a diagnostic dilemma as I thought it had a good story. Uh, once again, activity, you see that in the, in the mediastinum there, and we're going to take a closer look at that because the CT scan shows indeed a superhylar mass on the left with collapse of the left upper lobe. There's also some pleural fluid on that side. But if you look closer, a little farther down in the left hemithorax, there's some more activity. This mass turned out to be a non-smell cell lung carcinoma. But we were interested in what this other activity was along the chest wall. So when we did an axial scan through it or took a look at it in a different way, we saw that the activity localized to, to three ribs right in a row. Well, I guess that could be metastatic disease, but it would be unusual to hit three ribs in a row and not hit any other bones throughout the body. So if we took a closer look at the ribs, I didn't want to play that one. Could you back that up for me? There we go. Is that going to play it? Back it up one more slide. Here, I'll, try, I'll do it from there, I think. So we took a closer look at the data, and specifically at those ribs, and we found several non-displaced rib fractures in this area. 
that explained the increased metabolism. This was trauma in that area. And I thought the story was interesting because it turns out that this patient had a renal stone and they were thrashing around in bed and actually fell out of bed and broke several ribs. And when they went, when they went to the emergency room to work up their renal stone and their rib pain, we found, the, we found the mass in the left upper lobe and that's what led to the subsequent PET scan. So lots of different things can cause activity on pets. So a couple of, uh, of brief slides about other indications for PET that we didn't talk about, non-cancer indications. This is a slide from uh, an image from the Mayo Foundation that shows an image from PET CT of the cardiac, uh, I'm sorry, cardiac PET CT for cardiac viability. And there's a, what they want you to, to see here is there's a defect. This is a short axis view through the left ventricle. This is the right ventricle. And in the lateral wall, there's a defect in the lateral wall of the left ventricle that correlates with an area of previous infarction. There's also neurologic uses of PET that we mentioned er earlier, specifically in dementia workups. You see another uh, Mayo Foundation image that shows normal activity on the left-hand side and diminished activity within the cortex of the temporal parietal regions on a patient with known Alzheimer's disease. So there's lots of work being done in PET at different academic institutions. One of the, uh, the areas of work is, is looking at different radio tracers, different positron emitters. I'm not going to spend a really any time going over these. They're mostly of academic interest. They have short, very short half-lives on these positron emitters and essentially you need to produce them on site with your own cyclotron or, or they essentially dissipate before you can use them. And I just wanted to mention a couple future possibilities and areas of research that are going on right now. True molecular imaging is, is, is being investigated in a lot of different institutions where a patient's individual tumor will have receptors developed for it and you can label those receptors with positrons, in, in the, at least theoretically. And you can get a truly personalized distribution or PET-CT for that patient's individual tumor. Another area, there's another area that's working on fusing a PET scanner and an MRI scanner. You can see that that would be a very advantageous situation. You get the same anatomic localization, but you don't have the ionizing radiation and risk that you get with CT scanning. And I think there's also some handheld PET detecting devices that allow surgeons to operate after a patient has been injected with, with FDG to help them find active, metabolically active disease within the surgical field. Not being done everywhere, but a few, a few areas that are doing this kind of investigation. I think that's about all I've got. I'd be happy to entertain any questions that you have. Yes, sir. Well, that's very good, very good question. Um, I think the question was uh, essentially regarding how do you let the patient know what they're going to be going through on the day of the scan? What is the patient experience on the day of a PET scan? Well, at our institution, we we are in active contact, contact with the patient. We send them information in the mail and talk to them on the phone about what to expect. There is some preparation that they do the day of the study, essentially medications that we withhold, mostly in regards to, well, mostly in regards to uh, diabetics and things like that. But essentially the patient comes in at least an hour before their scan at a scheduled time and they will be in, essentially get an IV placed and they will, will essentially inject the FDG glucose into the, into the patient, and then they have to sit there for an hour where that, while that glucose localizes. And after about 60 minutes, the patient gets laid on a PET scanner and uh, have their scan, and after that, that scan probably takes 15 minutes, and after that, they're uh, allowed to leave. Uh, I'm not sure what other things are undergo. I, I guess I'd defer a little bit. Can you think of anything else that we tell the patients? Right. Setting just to avoid some of that muscular activity that we were seeing, you know, because we'll pick up muscular activity even in within the extraorbital muscles that are moving around. So that's one of those very important things. I just had a, a PET CT right. I did on somebody who did a lot of manual labor, and sometimes you can't avoid that. I mean, he had extensive in his forearms. He obviously been working quite hard. I mean, we do what we yeah. can to avoid that activity, and one of those things I like to tell them is that they will be in kind of a quiet, dark setting. Thanks. Any other questions? Is the CT part of this different or is it the same machine? It's the same machine. Actually, the PET scanning, the, 
the, de the PET detector gantry is fused right onto, it's the same gantry as the CT scan. And the patient lays on the table, goes through that gantry, and the CT data is acquired, and then the patient stays on the table, doesn't move, and then the PET data is acquired after that. And then the, the computers that we use co-register that data that gives us the fusion imaging that we saw. Yes? It's a good question. The CT scan we use, at least the CT scan images that I was projecting here, are acquired, but they're typically low dose CTs. We, we dial down the, the, the MA and the KEV, the energy of the, the electrons. So it's essentially as low dose as we can. We're using that data primarily for attenuation correction in, <coughs> to uh, give us better PET data. But we also use it for localization, as you say. Essentially, the CT that we acquire along with the PET data is much lower dose than any diagnostic CT that we do. Uh, on the order of, boy, half, about half the radiation. Um, as far as the PET radio tracer, uh, the, the FDG has a fairly short half-life, and they are exposed to some radiation there, but I think it's really a, a question of, of, uh, of risk-benefit analysis. The, you gain so much knowledge from, from the PET data alone that it's probably worth the exposure that they undergo. And I think the PET exposure is less than a typical CT as well. I'd have to get the actual numbers for you. Um, yes, ma'am. Very good question. Uh, the question essentially is in regards to cumulative exposure of radiation and what are the risks to the patient and do we have any safeguards uh, set up for that, particular, for that particular question. I think the answer is yes. I think the field of radiology, at least in the last five years, has been very concerned over how much radiation we are exposing the patient to. Um, and we've been addressing that problem not specifically with PET-CT but with all areas of CT in general because CT, generally speaking, is the highest exposure and it tends to be one of the most ubiquitous examinations that we do. So we've done a multi-pronged approach, at least from the radiology perspective. Number one, we want to make sure that this test that was ordered is truly indicated. Can we answer the, the question that was asked with a non-ionizing radiation examination, like ultrasound, like MRI? Is something else better for that patient specifically and more, more specifically for young patients who may go through Several, several subsequent examinations and follow-up examinations. So a scan that is not done at all is much better than a scan that's done in terms of cumulative exposure. After that, after the patient, we've decided that the patient does need the scan or, or would benefit from the scan, we try to dial down our technique, like I mentioned before, lowest dose possible to get useful information. Now, we can't dial it down too much because if we do that, our pictures become so poor, poorly resolved, that we didn't do the patient any good to begin with, and it's really useless radiation exposure. So number one, screening. Number two, dialing down the, uh, the radiation that we actually use for our examinations. And then three, for patients who are who get repeat scans or perhaps go to the emergency room several different times or have renal stones that get multiple follow-up renal colic CTs, we've set up a couple of, of, uh, of safeguards in our hospital setting. The clinician who's ordering a study actually if they order a study on a patient that had, that's had more than five CTs in the last year or two years, they get a warning flag that comes up. Do you realize that this patient has been exposed to five CTs in the last year? And then they have to really rethink, what question am I asking? Can I address it with a different test? So those are the ways we've gone about looking at, uh, at radiation exposure. Very important question. Um, and we're, we're trying to do the essentially... I think you'll hear from a lot of our, our pediatric radiologists who are going to speak after us about uh, imaging gently, using the least amount of radiation possible, because cumulative radiation exposure is a problem. And I think there's some recent data out there that shows that, that uh, medical radiation 
is causing cancers in significant portions of the population, specifically people who have been exposed to many CTs over the course of their life, and as particularly young people who have been exposed to radiation. Yes? That's a good question. Um, I'm, I know that, for example, if, if, if a young woman has been scanned multiple times for pulmonary embolism, get lots of chest CTs that have a lot of radiation associated with them, there is a worry of increased incidence of breast cancer. I think it's actually been proven. You can quantify how much risk you have by each, each CT that you undergo. To help combat that, we, we have been instituting a couple of different devices that are, met, that are radiation saving devices. We, we routinely put thyroid shields on patients and also breast shields on, on, uh, on young women when we do our CTs through the chest. But I know breast cancers are one of the cancers that we've seen increased incidence with or there's reported increased incidence with. And Yes, ma'am. Do you see false positives in hyperglycemia? We tend, that's a good question. Uh, the question was, in, do we see any false positive examinations in the setting of hyperglycemia? Um, generally speaking, we screen, we do check the patient's glucose before injecting the FDG. If it's too high, we try to reschedule the examination or bring that patient's glucose more into line. In my personal experience, I have not seen a lot of false positive. Generally speaking, I've seen increased muscle, muscle uptake in patients who are more hyperglycemic than others. Um, I don't know that I've seen any other false positives for hyperglycemia. I completely agree with that. I mean, uh, I think a, a, sometimes people would give a cutoff, an absolute cutoff, and I found that we usually said, well, we've already injected and we should just do this anyway. Again, another risk benefit. And the ones I've done, sometimes people I've seen the same. I've seen increased muscle activity. Sometimes when they've just injected insulin, again, which drives the, uh, the glucose analog into the muscle. But uh, uh, typically, I, I don't think I've seen the false positives and false negatives associated with uh, glucose. Uh, yes? You mentioned that um, there's normal activity in the brain. Can you explain the role for brain tumors, if any? Yeah, brain tumor, uh, the question is rega in regards to is there, is there um, utility for brain imaging in PET-CT? And the answer is yes. And outside of academic institutions or outside of academic institutions that do a lot of brain surgery, we don't see a lot of cases. But there, there is uh, reasonably good data out there for essentially restaging or treatment monitoring of brain tumors after resection, where essentially the, the PET scan shows increased activity in a resection cavity within the brain, but you have to determine if that's secondary to a radiation necrosis type phenomenon or if it's a residual tumor. And we get a lot of our data, or at least uh, I haven't seen any cases come through our scanner for specifically for brain tumor follow-up, but uh, my training at Duke, we saw a lot of brain tumors. And, and I th the bottom line is we were fusing MRI data with, with brain PET data at that time, and it was difficult to evaluate. It took a lot of, it took a lot of uh, hemming and hawing and is this enhancement real or not and we tended to err more on the side of trusting the MRI than the PET. But it is definitely, it's definitely worth doing in a situation where you're doing a lot of brain imaging. 